Grayson, you're you're kind of making me think, you know, if we go back to that second point we had that the authority of government comes from God. I think as Christians it's important to remember important to remember that when we are under the banner of Christ, when we have made a profession that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and we commit our life to him, we become citizens of heaven, first and foremost, right? God's authority comes first. All governments are are under underneath him, and we are citizens of that kingdom, first and foremost, right? And that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we that we ignore and pretend like Romans thirteen isn't there, but like as Blake pointed out, it's an idealized setting. And if and if there's conflict, if there's discord and what we would seem as unjust as understanding that foundation that God is supreme, right? Knowing that that is the case, our loyalty is there first. And if there's conflict between that loyalty and what the government is bringing up, and that's, and I'm not just saying sinful things, because I think that's, that's a mistake people make is to think, well, if the government's not asking me to sin, then right. I should just do it. Yeah. There, there's a distinction, which we'll get to in a little bit, but, um, but if there's conflict, the point being, if there's conflict between this earthly regime and our heavenly regime, we will, we sh- we must and should always side on the side of Christ. And, um, so, so let, let's, let's, let, let me touch a little bit further and I'll kind of move through this to some points we had here that, cause I think it's important to make. And maybe we could talk about this if we have differing views here. But what, what is, so if we understand, maybe we have that, uh, we've defined in hierarchy, right? Of government. But if we think about the church and the state, what is the right relationship? And I would say that, the as as we've talked about the government's relationship is the legal force it is the sword it is the it is a arm of judgment to as we defined kind of earlier to protect and uphold sanctity of life private property to defend people and god uses it you know as as he sees fit and a distinction here then is well the role of the church that is not the role of the church the role of the church her her focus is to uh is a, is a spiritual ministry. So I've heard it referred to, I think Sproul, uh, talked about it this way. I've read some stuff by him, but he, he referred to, and it's a pretty well known, I think, symbolism here of the sword and the keys, right? The government has the sword and the church has been given the keys, which is the gospel. And there are two different things. And where, where I think people can get confused and there were, this is a huge debate throughout history. Is, is it the church's role to ever be the sword? I would say no, right? And I think you guys would agree with me, but, um, maybe not. And, and Blake, you had asked me, uh, earlier, uh, maybe offline, if, if I'm a two kingdoms guy. And I would say no. I think the way I understand, the way I understand things to, to play out or my pers- theological persuasion here is that there is bifurcation between the sword, uh, the church and the state here. They have different roles. But upon the coming kingdom of Christ, all things run into him. He is the king of king, the Lord of lords. He is then, the, we read about the judgment, the great white throne judgment, Christ coming on a, on a white horse, bringing, you know, he is at that point, all things run into him. And we have a perfect, if you want to call it theocracy, maybe. Oh, I don't know I if so. that's the right term, but the kingdom of God. Where, yeah, where, where Christ is supreme and fulfills all offices. And I'm post mill, so we're working our way towards that. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> if you mean the uh, the literal thousand year reign of Christ on the throne of David, then we're on that with you, buddy. Uh, yeah, I can I can jive with that. All right, let's go. Um, one 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 example I jotted down here. If people are like, well, where is this in Scripture? Well, we've we've cited the Romans thirteen verse. We've uh, I've talked about Matthew sixteen when the keys are given to to Peter, which is not. Roman Mm -hmm. interpretation. Maybe that's a whole other episode, but this idea of the gospel being transferred, the the door opening to heaven is done through the gospel. It's the salvation is the the gospel is the power of power of salvation of the Lord, right? That is the keys. The spiritual realm has been given to the apostles. And if we think there's an example that, that may, may be helpful to bring clarification, if this is new to some people, if you look back in the old Testament, there was a King named Uzziah. And um, there's a real wonderful text in Isaiah 6 when Uzziah dies, and you see Isaiah sees the... Did I say that wrong? Maybe I got my names confused. Maybe mm-hmm. I didn't. Uzziah? Uzziah? Did I, I think I swapped. I think I swapped. Uh, maybe I didn't. I thought I swapped Isaiah no, 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 and Uzziah. <laughs> um, 
I did. Okay. Well, Uzziah dies and Isaiah then has this vision of the Lord. It's a wonderful throne room experience. One of the coolest, one of my favorite uh, texts in all the Bible. But Uzziah was a king of Israel and, a, and widely considered a good king for most of his life. And as time went on, and you can read about this in Second Chronicles, but as time went on, he began to, 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 to continue being as a king, he began to insert himself into the priesthood, which was not his role. Right. And the end of his life was pretty awful. He became um, a leper. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think he was like basically homeless kind of on the streets and, and whatnot. But, but the point being, the point I wanted to make here is he, uh, in second, second Chronicles 26, 16 reads, but when he was strong with his heart and was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord by God, by enter, by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So he was not a priest. He was a king. And point being in, in ancient Israel, there was still some division between the role of government being the king and the role of the church being the priesthood. Yeah. So we saw that again, both of those things are fulfilled in Christ, but he blurred those lines and his life was basically ruined from that point on. Well, I think of Amos seven. Um, I preached on the book of Amos a while back, but uh, you have Amos going up against um, a priest. I can't remember his name. Amaziah. So Amaziah is from a false priesthood to begin with. And what happens when you have the northern kingdom split from the southern kingdom, right? So who holds the legitimate kingdom then? Right? It's the kingdom of Judah. So the the northern kingdom splits off. The ten tribes go north. They institute their own priesthood because they can no longer go to the temple to offer sacrifices. And this guy, Amaziah, is part of this false priesthood. He ends up having just kind of this head-to-head -head with Amos in chapter 7 where I mean, Amos stands before him and um, basically tells him that judgment's going to come his way simply because he is um, he's a false priest. He says, your wife will become a harlot in the city. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled up by a measuring line, and you yourself will die upon unclean soil. And then he just doubles down because Amaziah is upset for one Amos is speaking of judgment against Israel. He just doubles down here. He goes, moreover... Israel is still going to go into judgment. <laughs> so the, the the whole thing I love about that passage, though, is you have a false kingdom under false kings uh, with a false priesthood, and every bit of it was set up because of the split that happens where they're now trying to scramble and usurping the priestly service in a way that they're trying to still um, interfere with a, a sphere that doesn't really belong to them at that point. Yeah. You never see yeah. that passage monogrammed on one of those hanging towel things in the Christian bookstore. <laughs> yeah. Your wife will become a harlot. It does not sell well on dish towels. <laughs> Here's a nice tea towel set. Congratulations on your new home. <laughs> well, so let, let's move on to the fourth point because I think Blake's getting antsy. Because he's ready no, for the no. end here, so let's keep keep moving. <laughs> no. So so point number four here. So we've talked about what the government is, where does it get, what it does, what's the government authority, where does it come from. We've defined a little bit more about the 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 separation of church and state as as we understand it from a biblical perspective, and and now let's talk about the importance of submission to the government, right? Because I do think you know if we if we go back and think about that Romans thirteen text it is an idealized situation but it's certainly not the only uh time we have in, instance we have in scripture where uh submission to government is is demonstrated or or explained right i mean jesus says when they when they they approach jesus you know and he says you pay uh, render unto caesar unto caesar right they ask him about taxes and stuff and he's basically saying you should submit to the government like you should do that and i think i think it is important before we talk about when we can and should, and I'll clarify, when we can and should disobey, because there are absolutely times, but there are also uh, important important times, and maybe the bulk of the time, when Christians should be known for submission, right? I, I think that's the spirit that we should be known for. That should be the default, well, right? The That should be the rule, not the exception. Especially if we recognize that all authority stems from...